The Cloud Returns podcast covers all types of software investing, whether seed, venture capital, growth equity, private equity, debt, and even the public markets. All right. Happy to have Pat McGovern from Bowery Capital on the show today. Pat, do you want to give us a bit of an intro on yourself and your firm? Hey, Matt. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, I'm Pat McGovern. I'm a senior associate at Bowery Capital. We are a pre-seed and seed stage investor focused exclusively on B2B opportunities. Offices in New York and San Francisco. We invest, you know, pretty generally across the B2B software landscape. I personally spend a lot of time on vertical SaaS and marketplaces, but we also invest really in anything that has a kind of B2B sales motion. So that could be cybersecurity, you know, data tooling, developer tooling. The one requirement is it has to be, you know, in the B2B landscape. All right. Well, let's, you know, we're going to make the whole show about vertical SaaS. I know you've written there and we'll include some of your resources in the show notes. And the first jumping off topic would be kind of like learnings you've seen at Bowery for seed stage companies selling into enterprises. Like what are the pitfalls, opportunities, like just some pattern recognition there. Absolutely. Yeah. I think for early stage companies in general, it's hard to sell into enterprise and that holds for vertical SaaS businesses, right? So, you know, these like fortune 500 companies, they want, <laughs> they want you to have a lot of other user testimonials. They want you to have, you know, SOC 2 certification. They want you to have a lot of things that, you know, a company that's been around for six months may not have kind of achieved yet. I think there's a reason you, if you look across vertical SaaS more generally, most of these companies start off selling into SMB or mid-market and then over time, as they scale up the product, we'll kind of develop an enterprise sales motion. You know, and that usually means their product has got like enough features, enough modules to really command a high ACV to go through that long kind of sales cycle that an enterprise requires. So, you know, something to keep in mind that we think about a lot as investors is, and again, this holds for vertical SaaS, but for horizontal as well. Just you know, you basically have eighteen to twenty-four months from when you raise a pre-seed or seed round to hit the next revenue milestone. If you try to sell exclusively into enterprise, you get stuck in like a, a six to twelve month procurement cycle and it doesn't work out. You know, that can basically be kind of the death knell of the company. Whereas when you're going for SMB mid market, a lot easier to increase the velocity of your onboarding. So, you know, you can just get more users more quickly. Yes, they're lower kind of contract value, but it's just going to show momentum to to investors when you're trying to raise that if you're pre-seed that seed, if you're seed that A. I think also like if you look at the vertical SaaS companies that have actually gone for enterprise. So there are some, right? Like Encino, mm -hmm. Guidewire. These are companies that IPO'd with, you know, 100 customers, 200 customers, right? When you think about Toast, they've got thousands and thousands of customers. Service Titan, tens of thousands of customers. The vertical SaaS companies that seem to be able to go to enterprise like right away and always basically only play in the like high ACV bucket. They're generally like spin outs. So like Viva is in that high ACV, high ACV bucket. They spun out of Salesforce. Encino spun out of a bank in North Carolina. So like, you know, they have the support to kind of have more time, live inside a big enterprise, spin out, and then start playing in the enterprise lane. I think if you're going from like zero to one without some kind of spin out or some kind of like, you know, really patient financial backer, you're kind of going to have to go SMB mid-market and then creep up over time. Yeah, which makes perfect sense, right? There's not going to be a lot of greenfield opportunities in enterprise technology in 2023 for, yeah, that are, for that some are seed taken. stage company to come just take advantage. Oh, okay. Vertical pharmaceutical CRM, right? Like Viva, yeah. Viva accomplished that 20 years ago now, 15. Yep. Interesting. And do you guys have a bias preferring to kind of back someone when they're still SMB middle market and work with them on the enterprise side? Yeah, I think historically, that's where we've invested most frequently. I think just generally, if you look at the vertical SaaS opportunities that come across our desk, that's kind of like the more accepted playbook of we're going to start down market, we're going to build the product, we're going to go to mid market, and then eventually we're going to start onboarding, you know, the large leaders in whatever kind of industry we're, we're building software for. It's just much more common to come across. And it's more of a kind of understood playbook. For sure. And maybe the easiest thing and most helpful thing for, you know, operators listening would be, you know, what are your investment criteria specific to vertical SaaS? Yeah. So I would say there's a few things we look at. Most of these are cliche and you've kind of heard them before, but there's a reason that everyone looks at these things. First would be market size. So I think about that kind of in two ways. So one is, is this a massive market where there's competition, but like it's huge. So if we can even peel off a few percentage points, that's like a, a substantial business. Or is it a small market where, you know, it's, it's not like, you know, restaurants or construction or some huge, you know, several percentage points of GDP kind of category, but there's no competition, right? So there's the potential to kind of win the whole market. That's how I think about it. You either need to have a giant market, you can win like 
a fifth of, or you need to basically go after a small market and get everyone to use your product and become the industry standard. Both of these are kind of getting harder to find, right? I think from an investment standpoint, a lot of the massive markets that are like several GDP points, toast for restaurants, Procore for construction, these are like kind of taken, right? Someone has gone out and won. And in these smaller markets, now you're seeing lots of founders, you know, vertical SaaS is kind of a cooler category to be building in than it was five or 10 years ago. These, these smaller opportunities are seeing more and more kind of cloud native next generation offerings going after the same opportunity. So instead of construction, it's like window replacement for contractors with under 50 employees, right? And there's four people doing it and they all have a smart founder and they're all cloud native and they're all, you know, running the playbook of like, you know, the best summer layer cake, we're going to do all these different things to generate revenue. That's tricky too. So it's like, we're trying to find something that's not in either of those buckets. And it gets harder every day because there's more, just more competition. Now on the other side, there's more companies that are kind of interested in, in adopting software, particularly in industries where that wasn't the norm. So these things kind of can offset each other. The other thing we really think about is the founder, right? So you hear about product market fit, like founder market fit is a huge thing, particularly in vertical SaaS. We also see this in, in vertical marketplaces where it's like, ideally the founders from the industry, like the dream team is like, some person that worked in the industry for 20 years, knows everyone, has like a best friend who's technical and they're coming on as the CTO and they like have both halves of the equation. Now, again, not every founder is going to be from industry and that doesn't like disqualify you from running a vertical SaaS business by any means. But if you're not from the industry, I think we really want to see, have you really gone deep on the problem? You know, spent a lot of time with potential users, you know, like done some kind of secondment to their business where you like worked alongside them for six months and understood every little nuance. Cause I think that's really what makes these businesses work is having some kind of weird unlock that is an insight, you know, cause you are from that space, right. Or you've really done your homework. I think what we kind of tend to stay away from is the more like, you see this a lot now that vertical SaaS is, is kind of hot where it's like, I'm an ex Uber engineer, ex Stripe engineer, ex, you know, insert hot company of the year, whatever, you know, time period you're in. And now I'm going to revolutionize like the waste management industry and build this software for it. And like, I don't really know anything about the waste management industry. I've read a few blogs about, you know, vertical SaaS revenue streams and building a company in that business model. But like, we try to stay away from that. I think that historically does not work as well as when you have someone, you know, who's from that world you're trying to serve. The third thing we think about in terms of like market size founder, the other is just like, what is the IT budget in that industry right now, right? So I think about it uh, as greenfield opportunity versus like replacement cycle opportunity. So greenfield is an industry where there's no software right now, right? And you, and you believe you're going to convince everyone in say the waste management industry, the landscaping industry, whatever, pick the most offline thing you can think of that they're all going to start carrying around iPads and using like a cloud software platform to run their entire you know day-to-day -day operation that's one end of the spectrum the other is there's an it budget there are software incumbents ideally they're like 10 to 20 years old don't have a cloud offering you know very behind the times unpopular with their users like something that everyone hates is a good thing to try to replace those are kind of the two two like scenarios i would say i i kind of prefer the latter so it's like there's already spend in this these buyers already spend a lot of money on software or at least some money on software and they don't like that software and it's like there's a natural kind of rollover that's happening that's one scenario you see a lot the other scenario where they, no one uses software yet and you're going to convince them that now is the time. I just think I've seen a lot of people get burned on that, where it's like, you know, everyone's like, now digital natives are taking over. Everyone's going to start, you know, using software for everything. And I, I do believe that, but like, you need a catalyst, right? And trying to time when people are going to make a huge behavior change, I think is a lot harder than someone has software they don't like, and you're going to sell them a new version. <laughs> you know, I think it's just a little, it's a little easier to make that switch. And I think this is helpful for, you know, having gotten to know some entrepreneurs over the year where kind of like the venture capital, private equity, all of it is very much a black box, right? Of yeah. how things happen. And let's say you're pursuing a vertical SaaS, like home inspection SaaS, right? Or one of these appropriate for 2023, recognizing mm -hmm. the realities of what already exists. Like, What does your industry due diligence look like at the early stages when, you know, that deal comes across mm -hmm. your desk in home inspection, vertical SaaS? Like, do you go look at the number of competitors? Like, how do you guys like quickly sort through kind of the industry side of things. Yeah, I mean, I think it's pretty easy to get a handle on competitors nowadays. There's just a lot of industry reports out there. Honestly, what I do is half times I'll just Google. I'll Google like, uh, I'll find one competitor in the space and then Google them and see who buys Google ads against them. <laughs> and you can kind of quickly start to see like who's who's sponsoring against that. And all of a sudden you have six or seven competitors that are all buying for this keyword. So like they're probably in the right space. I mean, it's a mix of like, you know, traditional online research and talking to people. I feel like talking to people is more effective because you just get more candor. I think it's, you know, a lot of industry reports, they don't want to offend anyone. So it's kind of like <laughs> a, little, a little more polite. So I come from an investigative research background. So I try to talk to as many industry people as I can. I mean, that can be touched 
tough because the early stage, it's not like a PE process where you have like five months of research time, right? Or three months. It's like you got a few weeks. So even just scheduling the calls can be tricky. I'll see one place I found that's been interesting for figuring out so the views on the existing incumbent software in a given industry is, is Reddit. So going to subreddits for like whatever the random industry you're dealing with is like we looked at a real estate CRM. So I went to like the commercial real estate broker Reddit and you search software and you have tons of threads and people being extremely candid saying this software is garbage or I love this or this, you know, make me makes my job a hundred times easier. And you can get like more unvarnished opinions. And I think you might even get on like a G2 or even if you call someone up, you find on LinkedIn because there's still like a, a level of politeness that you don't get on the anonymous, you know, message board side of the internet. But it's, it's a mix of like, you know, just reading a lot and talking to people. It's nothing too crazy. I think also... A lot of it is in industries that don't really use software is like talking to people and be like, would you really use this? You know, like what is the bar for getting you to really change your behavior? In industries that have software, it's like, how much do you hate the incumbent and how sticky are they? Like, could you feasibly move or is there something that would like be an operational nightmare if you were to switch? And would you say for like a vertical SaaS founder, right? Like there's more of an onus for them to kind of document the industry landscape, their customers' problems, the setup to make it easier okay. for an investor like yourself compared to someone pursuing something horizontal and kind of can get by with some very high level slides. Yeah. I mean, like one of the main things we look for is how much have they talked to end buyers, right? Like, do they have a sense of what that buying process would look like, who these people are, what they care about? Obviously, all founders say it's a massive industry. They all have a slide saying this is the biggest, you know, the biggest opportunity ever in the history of software. So like some of that stuff, I think gets discounted a little by VCs. I mean, the more like work, the particularly the early stage, the more work the founder can show they've done that is like shows they're invested in the idea. And it's not just like, oh, let's see if I can raise some money off this deck. And if I do, then I'll run with it for a few years. You know, it's kind of, it just shows like the, level of thought they've given to the, to the opportunity. Okay. That's kind of my bias as an investor. And I think like for people to understand that people like yourself, right? Like how many deals do you look at like in a given month? I think, I think more in, in quarters, but yeah, sure. In a quarter, we'll look like a couple hundred. Exactly. You know, so you lay that out and then between meetings and everything else, like the amount of time you have to understand that home inspection SaaS company is like very, very, very narrow. Yeah. And honestly, I, I love when founders have like done a ton of research already and they can, they have a good, you know, right after the first call, they're like, here's a data room. Here's all these calls I've done. Here's all this industry research. Like, I don't know, it, it you know, helps us get more conviction. It's like, oh yeah, this, you know, we obviously got to validate that and check it against, you know, less biased sources. But uh, yeah, I mean, I, I'm happy with, I want the founder to send me as much stuff as they can so I can really understand the opportunity more. Cause like we're more experts in the business model than in an industry, right? Like I don't know that much about pest control or, you know, moving or whatever, but like, I do understand like, you know, kind of things are looking for that can make this business model work in that setting. Interesting. Interesting. And I know when we were, you know, coordinating for the show, you brought up a dynamic of people who are choosing verticals or problem sets that are too narrow relative to kind of the onus of raising venture money. Could you elaborate more on that? Yeah, no, happy to. So again, kind of touching on what I said earlier, you know, a lot of the like huge industries that are several points of, you know, GDP, those have been taken, right? Those are the, first, you know, the most obvious ones to build for, right? And then you see this kind of trend where people are going more and more narrow. So founders, instead of going after, you know, commercial trucking are going after refrigerated trucking with, you know, fleet sizes of one to three trucks, like in the West Coast, right? And it's like, when you get so narrow, and part of that's just competition, right? Because that way you can say, we don't have any competitors, right? That The famous one's different, we're doing something unique. But like, you know, the way we think about investing in general and, and vertical SaaS is like, can this business get to like 50 million, 75 million ARR in five to eight years, right? Like, is there even, an, you know, when you're in such a narrow bucket, it's like, you really need everyone in that entire category to start using your software. And you need to get a ton of price power and you need to do that all in like five six seven years so i think when you're going really narrow it can still be a great business right there are sometimes there are reasons to have you know something more specialized for some subsector of of a category but maybe those should be bootstrapped or they should be kind of like very lightly capitalized you know grow more slowly kind of you know, reinvest in the business rather than taking on a ton of outside capital and trying to scale this thing in a five to 10 year window when there just might not be enough of an opportunity there to get an exit. And that's when all these founders kind of get stuck in like trying to raise money, trying to raise money. And it's just, I just think like, you know, you don't always have to take venture money. And there's a lot of vertical SaaS businesses where founders have made you know very healthy returns, kind of getting one financial partner or, or bootstrapping and kind of, you know, not getting on the venture bicycle of just,
just like, you know, scale, 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 spend, 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 raise, 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 you know, there's other ways to, to grow these businesses that can still work. I think also multiples and software change dramatically in the last, you know, whatever, 18 to 24 months. So maybe some of these more narrow vertical SaaS companies could still be a big exit at like a 10 to 15 X revenue multiple. Now, when you see revenue multiples closer to like five to seven X, it gets that much tougher to be trying to raise money for like what's the, you know ultimately like a pretty narrow opportunity. And to frame this for folks, would you offer any like TAM guidance of like what would be too narrow or should you just really work from that? Like, hey, can this be 50 million of ARR in seven years type of framework? I would say the the latter, just because like TAM, maybe it's different. If there's already five people going after it, it's a lot tougher. If no one's going after it, maybe you have a smaller market, but you've got kind of a head start or some kind of distribution advantage. I just think more about like, can you get to 50 million in ARR or 70 million in ARR in, you know, five to eight years? That's kind of like a good North Star to work backwards from and then think about, all right, how can we, how can we get there? That's a, you know, when you think about that, that's just like a really, really, really high bar for vertical SaaS. Right. Like to hit that ab- prevent, absolute prevent amount. Your, yeah. Prevent the backable vertical sets. For sure. Companies can still do well. But I think, yeah, I mean, that's I think that's the toughest thing. I The main reason we turn down founders is market size and just being like, I don't see a way that this gets to 50 million in ARR, like period. And that's a function of that narrowing of, of what they're going after. So they're all kind of like interrelated. Yeah, it's fascinating. I have never really thought of some of these vertical markets really through a like hyper growth seed stage where you're kind of multiple of money requirements are just so wildly different than some other ways I've invested that yeah it's it's interesting to think about like what that bar really implies like yeah no it's uh that's why we only do like you know six to eight new investments a year right? and I look at a lot of a lot of companies for us to get to that number and I guess with that in mind too is you know there's all this generalized discussion and you see right. you know these benchmark reports out from Insight or Bessemer or KeyBank right and all of the yeah. SaaS world is kind of conflated but these vertical SaaS companies are fundamentally very different than some of these like growth at all costs super well funded horizontal plays so how should like a vertical SaaS founder think about like their metrics relative to what you know you can kind of go on Twitter or LinkedIn and consume all the time from a benchmark perspective. Yeah, I would say I mean what one area where it differs and you see this in if you just read like you know what's been written already about about vertical SaaS is you know customer acquisition hypothetically should be a little cheaper than in a horizontal setting because you have a much tighter buyer bucket, right? It's like you're not selling some cybersecurity tool to every Fortune 1000 company. You're going after, you know, glass and companies, right? So there's like conferences, there are trade publications, you can target your advertising much better. I know there's a study that gets trotted out from time to time saying, you know, on average, vertical SaaS companies can acquire new users like 20%, a 20% cheaper than horizontal, right? So I think as a founder, like investors are going to want to see that you actually are getting that extra like operational leverage of getting your users relatively cheaply compared to other software companies. So if you're a founder, and you have like incredibly high customer acquisition costs, and you're building in vertical SaaS, you might want to try to rethink about how how you're marketing, how you're onboarding people, because that's going to be like a red flag for potential investors, right? I think another thing to think about, I don't know, it's like there's like the growth at all cost thing, right? Where you had companies lighting money on fire for like a decade, and then you have now it's almost swung the other way. We have we get pitch companies that are like we're profitable, and they're like we're about to be profitable, and they're like a seed stage company. It's like you really shouldn't. <laughs> if you're trying to go after like a venture scale outcome, you probably don't need to be profitable yet. You need to be growing and hiring a bunch of salespeople, and you know, kind of trying to really get the flywheel going. So I don't think like at the seed stage, I don't think you need to obsess too much about profitability, but you should show there's like a operationally sound business here and that you're you're getting some of the advantages that this business model should give you namely you know cheap cheaper users makes sense and i'm sure you're in a very interesting seat given kind of this explosion of ai even though ai and machine learning have been here for a while that you know starting november 2022 you know this explosive interest in ai in SaaS. yeah and like, what are some interesting things you're seeing in vertical SaaS? And like, do you have a kind of a thesis of how AI will play out in vertical SaaS? Yeah, no, it's uh, definitely an interesting time. I would say we've been trying to do a lot of research around that just because you know, every VC is. And it's like, there's a reason it's it's pretty wild, just the advances in the last year. We actually have a vertical AI and vertical SaaS market map that was going to come out this morning, but we're still editing it. So okay. hopefully tonight or tomorrow. But just we're highlighting a bunch of categories where we're already seeing AI having an impact act kind of on the vertical SaaS landscape in a bunch of different categories. I think our biggest challenge is trying to figure out who does this benefit, right? Does the do the benefits of AI accrue to the incumbents or do they go to kind of newer AI first, you know, 
next next gen vertical SaaS players. I think from our initial research, I think unfortunately it probably goes to the incumbents who see most of the upside, which isn't good for us because we can only really invest in you know companies that are generally one to three years old, right? And you know pre you know seed pre seed. I think there's a few reasons that we think it's probably going to accrue mostly to the incumbents. So. One thing is the speed of development, right? So we see a lot of, we get pitched, you know, AI driven B2B businesses all the time. And it's like, every founder says it's completely defensible, but also they built it in like two months. <laughs> so it's like, all right, you know, th these two things don't seem like they're both possible. And you say, you know, you can't really have a moat if, if two guys with minimal AI experience before this built this thing. I'm sure smart people at Toast, Procore, Service Titan, I'm sure they've got, a, you know, two dozen guys in a room working on this, right? Or, or women, you know, but like it's, this stuff is, the biggest challenge across all AI investing right now is what is defensible, right? Like. It the things are moving so fast and a lot of this stuff is basically free. It's like really hard to say. So I think one thing is like incumbents will be able to copycat most of what newer vertical SaaS AI native businesses are doing, right? It's stuff's not like not that proprietary in terms of like the technical risk. The other thing is the data advantage, right? So if you're service titan, your toast, you have an immense amount of data from your users that you can use to fine tune models and kind of get like an optimal outcome for that industry user type that and that's like, I think one way they can actually differentiate from the newcomer, right? It's like this model is not just some off the shelf, you know, open AI plugin. This is like, I took that and I've trained it on millions of restaurant transactions and reservations and whatever else. And it's like, you know, purpose built for this use case. So that's another advantage for the incumbents. And then thirdly, just like distribution advantage, that's part of the data thing too but you know they can roll this thing out to everyone like i'm sure like you haven't you see like you know notion came out with the ai yep. thing whatever months ago i guarantee every large vertical SaaS company is going to drop procore presents ai you know the same like salesforce rolled out the big ai announcement you know a month ago or so so when all these vertical SaaS kind of say series c and beyond businesses come out and drop we now present like ai enabled workflow that's like really bad for all these challengers that are saying we're doing an ai version because it's like well it kind of exists and it already has all this other stuff and it already has you know much more support and and, and product kind of depth. So yeah, I mean, I think it's tricky. Again, I could be wrong. I don't think anyone really has a perfect understanding of how quickly this stuff's moving. But the, the other thing is like, so where can newcomers win, right? I think there are still opportunities. So like, I think where existing players will win is an AI that's more, a lot of this is workflow tools, right? Like most AI, is, or sorry, most vertical SaaS is not like that, you know, across industries, there's obviously nuance and differences, but it's like, here's a tool where I can, my customers can schedule an appointment for X service. Yep. And then I dispatch my employee and then they pay me money. And maybe I lend them some financing and it's all, you know, it's like, there's kind of like a, a playbook that gets run across different industries. Like AI agents can do a lot of those steps, right? So it can make the tool a lot faster. And I think the tools that are more robust will be able to incorporate those agents. And it's a huge advantage. Now, I think where newcomers can win is like AI first vertical SaaS products that are doing something that wasn't possible before, right? Before, you know, whatever the last year. So like, yes, automating my scheduling instead of me clicking, yes, I approve the <laughs> this booking, like that's going to go to the incumbent. New stuff is like AI is enabling me to do something that just didn't exist. So like even up is a good example of this. They've raised a tremendous amount of venture money for such an early stage company, I think like 50 or 100 million and haven't been around that long. And they're creating claims packages. So basically personal injury attorneys submit claims packages to insurance companies. Most personal injury cases get settled, right? They never go to trial. So they they look through, say I get injured, they look through all my medical records. They look through my past earnings. They look at my like life expectancy, demographic information, all that. And they go to my insurer and they say, broke both his legs and he can't work anymore. So you should give him $2 million. You know, this is like, that's, that's what he's owed by, you know, whoever the defendant is that you're the insurer of. Like even up can basically dump in a ton of these records unstructured and then create a claims package that's like as good or better than what exists. Like that that can win because that's a new thing, right? It's not like, oh, this is an existing workflow we're going to speed up. This is something that was not possible for a computer to do, but now it has kind of the intelligence and flexibility to come across all this unstructured data and come out with like analysis and a real output. I think that's like where you can win. Another example, Harvey in law, yep. right? So one of the hottest, you know, vertical AI software companies, you know, there's been a ton of technology in the legal settings for whatever the last 20 20, 30 years, like e-discovery, document review, all these tools. There's already a lot of software there. What, what Harvey's going after is something different, right? It's actually drafting legal motions, complaints, what have you. Historically, the way lawyers have done this is they open up the Word doc for the last case that was similar, <laughs> control F the new plaintiff and defendant's names in, and then start, you know, using that as a skeleton to start building out a new kind of a new complaint for whatever the new lawsuit is. Like there's there wasn't really like technology involved in motion drafting, complaint drafting, brief drafting. So that's like an opportunity for Harvey. Wow, this is new. It's completely new. So like, I think that's where or you can build an AI native vertical company and not, and still like win, right? And not just get kind of front run by whoever's already in that space. So you have to go somewhere where there's like no technology at all almost if you want to win. So yeah, those are kind of my my thoughts, but we're still trying to get a handle on it. So, you know, I think even these companies that have raised a lot of money, not not that many of them have like reached mass distribution or, you know, huge
huge revenue number. So it's still extremely early in terms of what that's going to look like. And I guess I'm not a seed investor, never have been one. And the thing that confuses me or throws me off about this AI wave, right, is these things will be wildly capital intensive from everything I can tell, like the compute costs and building these models and the like. And like, are you guys afraid of the capital intensity of a lot of these AI models? I think it depends if you're building your own model or you're using like someone else's. I think you're not you're not seeing a lot of vertical SaaS companies that are building their own LLM. But also the cost of that has gone down dramatically in the last like six months. So it's hard to say. What most of them are doing is using like GPT or something, which is OpenAI is basically giving away yep. and then losing money <laughs> to operate. So I've thought, gone back and forth on that. Is, is one day OpenAI just gonna like crank up the price and all of a sudden extract all the value from people. I thought that for a while, but everyone I've talked to said, no, that's not really their plan. Their plan is kind of to become this free layer and then monetize in other ways. They're not free, but you know, the cost is is, is far less than what they're, you know, they're subsidizing it. Definitely something that I, I've thought a lot about. I mean, I think, I just think it's changing really fast and it's hard to say, but it's, it's a risk for sure. Yeah. It, it'll be interesting to see like SaaS, even at like modestly lower gross margins, like what's already, you know, to hit the scale points we talk about, yeah. right? Like you, you lower gross margins another 15, 20% and just like the amount of capital required to get to 25, 50 of revenue is... Yeah, there's, there's, there's a lot of like a fair amount of open source kind of AI infrastructure being created too that I think some of these businesses can rely on if the more blue chip LM start to charge, you know, serious prices. So I think weirdly that's some of that stuff's becoming a commodity too. I mean, this, this it changed every like two months. Like I saw a chart of how what how much more cheap it's become to train an LLM just in the last like four months because of a new way of going about it, and it literally cuts the price like eighty percent. So there's definitely pricing uncertainty around all this, which is one of the things that makes it even more difficult than uh, evaluating you know a typical kind of software investment. All right, all right, we'll we'll stop on the AI because I I do know that feeling that like the life cycle of the information and the takes kind of like expires every two weeks, and I'm still <laughs> trying to. <laughs> get oriented myself. And another thing that came across in our show prep, though, was about building out the layer cake, monetization models. And that playbook has gotten more and more advanced, technologies advanced in terms of like what is possible. Like I started investing in SaaS in 2009 and like lower middle market private equity companies. And the idea of adding payroll, right? to your mm -hmm. vertical set would just be this magical fantasy, right? There's just no possibility that could ever happen. And now you see that that's effectively like an API out there. So like, mm -hmm. what are some things that you're seeing? Like, what are some of your takes on like things Bowery likes you like, or things to avoid that, you know, kind of have more pitfalls or might not be worth, you know, all the effort to go create that piece, piece of the cake? Yeah, I would say, I mean, obviously embedding like fintech into vertical software has been, you know, a hot trend for a number of years now. I think the most successful route of approaching this has been kind of payment processing, right? So if you have a, you know, a customer facing piece of the software and you can have the business route their payments through your software, you can take a cut of that. And Toast is the best example of this. I mean, I think more than half the revenue is from payment processing uh, and they can, you know, charge a little markup on that. And then obviously they have someone else on the back end kind of, they have to give a cut to as well. It's a great way to make money, it's low risk. You know, I think customers are appreciative of having everything in one place. Processing payroll, similarly, you know, you can charge a markup on that. It's it's again relatively riskless. Helps you get kind of your tentacles deeper into the into the business you're supporting. One area where I've seen kind of some pitfalls is offering financing. So you've seen this in, in vertical marketplaces and in vertical SaaS, where you know we're going to also offer financing, you know, to customers whatever business we're selling our software into, right at at the point of checkout, right. So it's going to be like it's going to drive more activity because people that otherwise couldn't pay will now be able to transact. I've seen it, uh, people lose money like pretty severely <laughs> on some of those kind of opportunities just because underwriting business risk is very hard. I think I know how a lot of the people that are out there do it today and it's like inexact science. I think also in today's, you know, really high interest rate environment or not really high, but whatever, historically high, you know, in whatever the last 20 years, you know, you need to borrow, you know, at whatever, six, eight, 10%. And then you need to like lend it back out at an even higher rate to make any money. And then you also need to lend it out and even right above that to, you know, cover some of the defaults you're going to have. So you end up getting this really bad adverse selection problem where the only people that are willing to borrow from the financing that your vertical product offers are people that like don't have any other ways to pay for this, like in terms of a commercial line of credit or savings or, you know, a business credit card. <laughs> so it's like, I don't know, I think this gets very tough to, to really make money off that just because 
you basically need to charge such a high interest rate that the only people that will take it have like no other options. And you really don't want a loan pool of people who have no other options. I think also like software companies and marketplaces are not like bank lenders. They're not good at like collateralizing <laughs> these, these lending arrangements and like recovering assets they can sell. Oftentimes there's like very little in the way of underlying collateral. So I kind of think founders should maybe give a lot of thought to whether they want to, you know, turn that on in their business or maybe wait, you know, until they're big enough that they can experiment with it without taking any huge hits. So Pat, maybe just like, what's the pitch for working with Bowery? Like, what do you invest in? Like, why should they work with Bowery? Yeah, I mean, I think we know, we know Vertical SaaS pretty well. We spent, you know, as a fund, like the last 10 years kind of exploring the space. We're very involved investors in terms of, you know, this, the spectrum of seed investing goes from people that write a check and you never hear from them again to like, you know, very involved. We're definitely on the very involved side in terms of we take a board seat, you know, of our six full-time employees, two of them are platform team. They solely support, you know, the companies we invest in. And I think we just, you know, are kind of, we just know the space pretty well. We know the business model well, and we can kind of help, I think, use the learnings from investing in a lot of these companies and share them with founders, regardless of like what specific industry opportunity they're targeting. And like, what are your like typical check sizes, like typical ARRs, yeah. like any details that someone listening to this might get a sense of like, hey, do I fit? Yeah. So we're a lead investor. We almost always lead or co-lead. I would say I've seen three types of deals we've done. We'll do kind of like a pre-seed round. Say it's a million dollar round. We'll put in, you know, 750K. Those are often idea stage, little to no revenue, maybe, you know, some kind of design partners, but, you know, basically like at inception. We'll also do kind of what we call true seed, which is, you know, say a $3 million round. We'll put in one and a half or 2 million, lead it. That's generally, you know, they have a solid team in place. They've gotten, you know, some revenue going, you know, maybe say 100,000 or something. Something, right like there's there's traction it's going in the right direction it's it's scaling up really quickly in terms of like user interest mm -hmm. and then the, the third bucket we'll do is kind of the the larger seed so say like a five million dollar round we might co-lead with another seed fund we would do like two million they would do two million and then you know kind of follow on investors angels might might do the remaining million so and those are for like kind of companies that maybe already raised one or two million more mature kind of trending series a almost think like a seed extension or something right so those are the three kind of lanes that we we play in. and beyond that you know, we don't come in past the seed. We're always almost always going to lead and then we'll follow on through the A and B. And then beyond that, we generally kind of take a step back just given fund size. That makes sense. And uh, how big is the fund right now? So we're on fund three, fund three is $70 million vehicle. We're probably about halfway through making new investments out of that fund. Okay. And we, also, we hold back a lot for follow-ons just because as a seed investor, you really want to try to protect your ownership as long as you can, because the dilution gets pretty steep for, you know, the companies that really scale up. There's a lot of rounds of funding, you know, companies stay private a long time. So you have to kind of get a good ownership target early and then, you know, kind of ride the dilution down as, as the company, you know, raises series C, series D, et cetera. Great, great. And, you know, in the show notes, we'll include some of your uh, posts and thought leadership. I know you had a great write-up with Thomas Robb on Vertical SaaS a few months ago. That will be yep. very much in the show notes. Where else can people find you, read about you, kind of stay in tune with you? Yeah. So Bowery has, we have our blog, the Bowery blog. So BoweryCap.com slash blog. Mm -hmm. We're always putting out content there. We're actually working on a Vertical SaaS interview series right now where we're going to interview, in the process of interviewing a bunch of kind of founders in the Vertical SaaS space. And then we're going to, you know, we do kind of Q&As with them, get their learnings from, you know, the journeys they've been on also Twitter PW underscore McGovern. I got to get my actual name on there. That's a that's a bad handle out loud. Yeah, follow me there. Obviously, you know, connect on LinkedIn. Also, my email is patrick.mcgovern at bowerycap.com. Shoot me an email. Always happy to, to connect with anybody who's you know kind of building in the space or just you know interested in trading ideas. Awesome. And I'm going to leave you with a tough question to give something kind of actionable for people. What is your favorite question to ask like a founder when you're kind of screening them to see if they are backable? What are your best or some of your best questions? It's like one I've been asking. I mean, it changes. I feel like you go through phases with these things, but I feel like one question I've been asking a lot lately is like, what objections do you get from the companies that won't use your product, right? So try to understand. Usually that kind of gets them away from the like, everyone loves this. It's like, what do people like, you know, why aren't people going for this sometimes? It helps them kind of tease out how well they understand kind of the sector they're selling into and also just kind of like how candid they're willing to be about you know the challenges of of cracking whatever that space they're targeting is because if they weren't getting objections they wouldn't need our money right it would just be <laughs> you know the revenues would be you know up into the right right so there's kind of like i just like that when it gets out a little more vulnerability and like what are some patterns of founders you like like kind of like very analytical very customer centric like what are kind of like the ideal founder for you not just bowery but like you making an investment decision 
Yeah. I mean, this is also cliche of like the Amazon thing, right? Customer obsession, like how, how well do they understand the buyer type? Have they done like hundreds of customer interviews gone and like rode around say pest control example, have they like ridden around for three weeks with a pest control guy and just like watched everything he did, you know, kind of really lived that job if they're not from it to understand one, why people in that industry would even want software. And then two, like would actually like meet their needs and, and be adopted. And then another tough one, right? Yeah. Is, is the, the lightning round. Yeah. Well, the, <laughs> Okay. You know, if you're a good vertical SaaS founder, right, you should be able to kind of create some real economic value bootstrapped, right? Like cobble together enough customers, kind of the business model could lend itself to being ramen profitable. Like what's the case for a vertical SaaS founder who's talented to go the venture capital route? Yeah, I think often these are kind of winner take most or winner take all opportunities. So I think it's just basically speed to market, right? Like you can just get a lot more customers, get a lot bigger, a lot faster with with venture backing. I mean, it's the main reason to take VC money, period, right? But I think it's true in vertical SaaS as well. Like you can try to bootstrap it and reinvest off your own money. But if it's like a huge market, say restaurant, like other people are going to target it too. So you really want to get, you know, as far out in front of the competition as you can. And it's only getting more competitive, I think, just because, you know, maybe in the late 90s, early 2000s, when there weren't many people making industry specific applications, you could kind of like do it yourself and plot along. But I think now there's so many people looking at kind of the vertical SaaS for any opportunity they can find that even though there's no competition right now, there's going to be like very shortly if you get any kind of success. So, you know, having a more capital than your opponent is always, you know, a useful thing. Very good point. Like, I think some of the patterns we've seen in the past kind of like now you have to assume, you know, Bowery is going to be backing somebody and Bessemer, every little area is going to get funded in a way that did not get funded 20 years ago. And that, that kind of changes, you know, how a founder today should look at also at like the potential to achieve like a big economic outcome on a bootstrap mm -hmm. path, right? Which very, very possible if you were starting something in 2004, right? But in 2023, you know, just the game theory of it all has really changed. I hadn't given enough yeah. thought to that. No, and you see, yeah, you'll see like with vertical SaaS and vertical marketplaces, you'll see one get backed and then like three more get backed. And it's like the same thing, you know, but it's also, it's like, there's more competition, but it's a bigger opportunity, right? So there's things, I think, depending on what industry you're in, they can offset each other in kind of either direction. So, yeah. For sure. Well, I appreciate the lightning round questions, you know, just change it up a bit. And uh, yeah, yeah. appreciate you joining the show. We'll get this out on the, the podcast and we'll put some good show notes together and hopefully people come find you and Bowery. And if you're a vertical SaaS founder, uh, reach out to Pat, not me. And thanks for joining us. No, thanks for having me. It was great. Take care. <laughs>